Try to get the body in a comfortable position. Try to keep your back straight, not ramrod straight, but comfortably straight. Face forward, close your eyes. Put your hands in your lap, your right hand on top of your left. And there you are. The next step is to put the mind in a comfortable position, and that takes more time. First you start with thoughts that are comfortable to think. May I be happy, may all living beings be happy, as in the chant we chanted just now. That's a comfortable thought to think. And think about the possibility of a true happiness, a happiness that doesn't harm you, doesn't harm anybody else because it comes from within. Those are good thoughts to think as well. True happiness is possible and it doesn't have to harm anybody, unlike most of the pleasures of the world where someone gains something and somebody else loses. And not just loses, some people actually are actively harmed by other people's search for happiness. But here's a search for happiness in which nobody gets harmed. So where do you find that happiness? You find it within. So the next step is to focus on your breath, because the breath is a good anchor for the present. And it's also what makes the present livable in terms of the settling into the body in the present moment, because the breath is the part of the body that's most changeable and also lies most under your control. And it can have an effect on whether you're going to be sitting here in pain or sitting here in pleasure. Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths and see how that feels. If it feels good, keep it up. If not, you can change to shorter breathing or longer breathing, heavier, lighter, deeper, more shallow, faster, slower broader, more focused. There are lots of different ways you can breathe. And so experiment to see what the range of breathing can do for the body. It's like getting a new stereo. You fiddle with the dials to see what the, the different dials can do. What kind of noises can you get out of your stereo? And then you finally decide on the settings that you prefer. And you can do that with the breath. Nobody's here to tell you that one way of breathing has to be better than another. You get to choose. And in choosing, you develop your own powers of discernment. As you begin to see that some ways of breathing feel good for a while, but after a while they don't feel so good. Well, you get to change, and you try something else. And you also notice how you think about the breath. What kind of concept do you have of the breathing process? When you breathe in, what's actually happening? You know, there's air coming in and out of the lungs. But there's also, as you begin to get more sensitive to the process, you, you begin to see there's also a sense of energy that flows through the body. And that has a huge impact on how you're going to be sitting here for the rest of the hour. If the energy is allowed to flow smoothly and freely more likely to be here in a sense of comfort. But when the Buddha talks about the mind settling in and to develop pleasure and rapture, it's right here in the way the breath energy flows that the pleasure and the rapture are going to appear. So you work with that. Once you find a sense of ease, what can you do to maintain that ease? You can't clamp down on it. But you can't take a cavalier attitude toward it either. It is something you want to protect. So you have to be very observant to how you're experiencing the body in the present moment, to notice what ways of breathing create a sense of ease, what ways of breathing destroy that sense of ease, what ways of breathing, what ways of focusing on the breath energy help to maintain a sense of ease 
allow it to grow to a sense of fullness so that you feel full all the way through the in-breath and, and all the way through the out. Don't try to squeeze the energy out as you breathe out, because that prevents that sense of fullness and rapture from arising. So this allows us to sit here, the body comfortably in position, the mind comfortably in position. And that in and of itself can be healing. healing to the body, healing to the mind. So you want to learn how to maintain that. But it's more than just healing. As we all know, there's another side to the meditation, which is gaining insight. And why is it necessary to have a sense of comfort and ease in body and mind to gain insight? Because a lot of the issues that we're going to try to gain insight into are things that are not very comfortable to think about. And normally we approach them with a sense of desperation, fear, anxiety. Like that chant we had just now, aging, illness, death, separation. These are things we don't like to think about. And most people take an ostrich attitude toward them. So if you put, bury your head in the sand, it's not going to be there. Well, that, of course, doesn't work. The body grows old even as you're sitting there. You grow sick. All those germs come floating in the air. And of course, it's going to die someday. This is something we all know. As I said, death is one of the things that's totally certain, and yet most of us pretend as if it's not going to happen, because we don't know how to think about it. We can't approach it with a sense of comfort, and so we try to avoid it. But what the Buddha is having us do as we meditate is to develop the sense of comfort in body and mind so that you can look at these things from a balanced perspective. That even though they're inevitable, you don't have to suffer from them. And that's an important point. For most of us, just the idea of aging, illness, and death causes, causes us to suffer, even more so than the actuality. As you grow old, you find there are things you can't do anymore. Your body simply won't let you. When you're sick, you're even more debilitated. Of course, when you die, the body doesn't come and say, okay, I'm going to die on such and such a date, and you get everything ready in time. Is this a convenient time to go? If not, we can negotiate. Doesn't discuss that at all. If it's going to go, it's going to go. And the issue is, how do you learn not to suffer from those things? Well, you develop qualities of mind. And you also develop a certain attitude toward life. This is important. You can get a sense of what's really important in this time that we have when the body is still healthy, when it's still relatively young. It's still functioning, at least to some extent, and while we're still alive. What's really worthwhile in this life? There's a reflection that the Buddha has the monks reflect on every day, and it's not just for monks, for everybody who practices. It's what am I becoming as days and nights fly past? The question he has you ask every day, what am I becoming as days and nights fly past? It's an interesting question. Because on the one hand, we all know about the, the not-self teaching, but here the Buddha is asking you to reflect on yourself. What am I becoming? Because there are areas in the practice when it is useful to develop a healthy sense of self. The reflection here is to develop a sense of heedfulness, because all skillful qualities of the mind come from being heedful. And for a lot of people, as days and nights fly past, all they can think about is, how can I cram in as many pleasures as possible, or cram in as many memories as possible? I want to make sure I'm not missing out on anything. Of course, when you do one thing, you're missing out on something else. And suppose you take that attitude that life is important in the sense that you have lots of memories. Well, we all know what the process of memory is like.
we stash away certain ideas. And as they get brought up from the mind to reflect on, each time you put them back in the mind, they get changed. And so over a while, your memories begin to change. And so what have you got? The mind is beginning to lie to itself about what it saw, about what happened. Years back, I was in Alaska. This was, what, 1997, 1998. And I went back again in the year 2005, and allowing for the fact that things do change. Still, I found that many of my memories were impossible. The things I remembered from my first trip just couldn't have been in terms of sights I had seen, places I had noticed, details that had struck me before. I went back and realized they couldn't have happened. And so you begin to wonder if a life spent gathering up memories. After all, the memories are totally worthless. So the Buddha doesn't have you reflect on, what am I gathering up as days and nights fly past? What, what am I becoming? What kind of person are you becoming? What qualities of mind are you developing? Are you developing laziness? Are you developing complacency? Or are you developing heedfulness? Are you developing mindfulness? Because as the Buddha said, the things that we tend to think about, they form an inclination for the mind, or as we would say, ruts for the mind. Ways in which you tend to act, ways in which you tend to think. And each time you go over that same pattern, you're creating a deeper and deeper rut in the mind. And do you like the ruts that you've been creating for yourself? Do you like the way you tend to act? Because this is important. They talk about people who lose their memory as they get older. But many of their personality traits are still there. And if you're developing kindness, compassion, mindfulness, even when your memories are gone, you still have something valuable. But if you've been developing your irritability, if you've been developing your, your anger, developing your selfishness, then those are the qualities you'll be left with. And are those qualities helpful? I noticed in Thailand a number of meditators that I knew had gone through brain damage, either through an accident. There was one, one of a John Fuang students who had been through an operation on his heart. And apparently the doctors had clamped off the wrong arteries. He came out of the operation and he realized that his brain wasn't functioning the way it had been before. But he'd been developing the mindfulness and the alertness through his meditation that enabled him to handle that fact with a lot more skill. So are you developing the skills, mental skills you're going to need as the body begins to malfunction? Or are you developing mental attitudes and habits that are going to make things worse? This is good to reflect on. Because it gives you a handle on this whole issue of aging, illness, and death, that there are things you can do in preparation. Because one of the reasons most people don't like to think about it is because they feel there's nothing they can do. When illness comes, we have to give the body over to the doctors. The doctors will take care of it. Well, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Well, the process of death. Well, if death just happens, you can't really do anything about it, you can't prepare, so you might as well not think about it. Well, that's not the case at all. There's a skillful way to die, and there are many, many unskillful ways to die. And they depend on the mental qualities you've developed, on what you've been becoming. So this is one aspect of the practice where it's useful to think in terms of who you are, what you are becoming. It's a skillful use of the sense of self. That's an important thing to reflect on right there. It's not that every time you have a sense of self it's going to cause you to suffer. Some t ways of thinking about yourself are actually part of the path. Toward the end of the path you won't be needing them anymore. But when you're choosing what to do, you have to have a strong sense of what's worthwhile, what's not, what you'll be benefiting from down the line, what you'll be suffering from down the line, depending on what you're doing right now. 
And that sense of self is an important one to protect, because it keeps your actions in line, it gives you a sense of priorities, it fosters that sense of heedfulness that allows you to stay on the skillful path. So these are distinctions that are important. Okay, it's not the case, again, that non-duality is where we're all headed or what we want it to fill up in the path. We have to have a strong sense of what's skillful and what's not, because we are making choices and they are important. You can't simply go on the idea that, well, my motivation is compassionate, therefore everything I do out of my compassionate motivation is going to be skillful. That doesn't work at all. You have to educate your compassion. Because sometimes what seems to be compassionate right now, as you begin to look down the line, is not was not the right or wise thing to do. So this requires that you be careful, that you notice what's happening. And you begin to detect that as days and nights fly past, you begin to see signs of complacency. You can do something about it. You begin to see signs of mindlessness. Okay, you try to develop mindfulness instead. You've got to keep watch on these things, because with the passage of time, we're used to when we're young that as you got older, you develop more and more abilities. But then there comes a point where the body begins to reverse direction. You lose abilities. You lose strength. And for a while you can make a difference by exercise and by watching after your diet. But they've done some studies to show that there are certain points as you get older that exercise doesn't make any difference anymore, that the body's just going to decay regardless. And some forms of exercise we've discovered are actually bad for the body. So you have to be very careful. And at the same time, realize that your true wealth lies in the mind. And so are you developing wealth in the mind, or are you squandering your wealth? Are you trading candy for gold, or are you trading gold for candy? There's a story in the canon of two men who, after a village has been evacuated, either it was because of a disease or something, everybody left, and they had to leave in a hurry, so they left a lot of their belongings behind. So after a while, these two men who say, let's go check out this village and see what was left behind. Maybe there's something valuable. And they go through and they, saw, they find some flax plants that had been harvested and were, were, getting, were being prepared to make linen. So they load themselves up with the flax plants. So at least flax plants have some value. But then they went on and they found linen thread. And one man said, well, this is what we had the flax plants for anyhow, so let's throw away the flax plants and take up the linen th thread instead. The first one says, no, I wrapped up my flax plants really nicely. I don't want to let go of them. So one man throws away his flax plants and takes the linen thread instead. The other one keeps his flax plants. They go along a little further and they find linen cloth. Now the same thing happens. One of them throws away his linen thread to take the linen cloth, but the first one may keeps his flax plants. And from linen cloth they find things of greater and greater value until they finally run across copper, silver, gold. And so when they're finished, one man returns from the village and all he has is those flax plants that he wrapped up so nicely, whereas the other one comes back with a whole load of gold. The wife of the first man was pretty upset. The wife of the second man was very happy, because the second man knew what to throw away, knew what to keep. So you have to ask yourself, do you know what to throw away? What are you gathering up? Are you gathering up just memories, or are you gathering up skills? The skills are gold. 
the memories are flax plants. And the goal is going to be helpful. As the inevitable happens, as the body grows ill, as it ages, as it begins to lose a lot of its functions and finally dies, the qualities of the mind you have are going to be your gold. So what are you gathering up as days and nights fly past? Because that's what you're becoming as days and nights fly past. This is one of the reasons why we try to get the mind into a state of comfort and ease, so we can think about these things clearly, helpfully. So that we'll recognize gold when we see it, and we'll know what to do with it. <laughs>